Hola. <risa> Buenos días. <risa> Fisioterapista, dolor crónico. Vamos a la playa. <risa> Dos cervezas, por favor. <risa> so I'll probably continue in English because I've used all the Spanish words that I have in me. <risa> It's a true honor to be here. Thanks a lot, on Antonio, for the, the nice uh, introduction and the nice uh, invitation to, to speak here to, the, to, to uh, your colleagues here at, at the university. And uh, as introduced, I, I would like to dedicate this lecture to exercise therapy for people having chronic pain and also many of those uh, things that I will be talking about are applicable to people having chronic fatigue. And it's not so much about applying simple exercise physiology to people having chronic pain because many people having chronic pain or chronic fatigue they struggle with applying exercise therapy. They are keen to try it, but once they try it, they struggle because they experience that it increases their pain or it increases their fatigue, which is somehow contradictory to the idea of exercise being a treatment for their pain or fatigue. And that's why we think it it's, it's often seems to patients that exercise therapy for people with chronic pain is like an inconvenient truth. It's supposed to be evidence-based treatment, but it's very difficult to train them. And that's what I will deal to, uh, about today in this lecture. And I do this on behalf of the Pain in Motion research group and all the people that you see on the slide are actually people from our group at our university in Brussels. And One of them is Laurence Leise, and Laurence is with us here today. She, fl she flew in this morning together with me from Brussels. Uh, she's sitting here in the front row, and she's also uh, here because we are planning to do more collaborative work with Antonio, with, with, with you guys. Uh, so that's why Laurence is also here, also because uh, Laurence did her PhD on post-cancer pain in the field of oncology, and we're planning to do uh, collaborative work with, with Antonio. Uh, Laurence is a very special one. Uh, she's published uh, more than 15 papers. She's a very high potential postdoc, early postdoc, and she also has a strong teaching uh, record, and that's why she's now already a part time visiting professor in our department. Uh, but So feel free to contact her and to talk with her later on today. That, that's why we're here, to, to get to know each one of you and to, to learn about your work. Uh, but also if you approach her, she might screen you from top to bottom because within our department, she is known as the fashion Gestapo. <laughs> because she's very critical about how you dress and she probably has some things to say to me about how I'm dressed today. So don't, don't feel afraid or, or surprised if she screens your clothes. Besides that, she's a very nice lady. We're with the two of us today, but the group is much larger than the two of us, of course. So if you want to learn more about our Pain in Motion group, check us out on our website and our social media. We try to disseminate some study findings. And also, if you have stuff that you would like to share through our social media, feel free to contact us. We're also always happy to, to share your work on our website with invited blog posts or invited... Uh, 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 posts that you would like to share with our audience. This is not the same slide as my first slide because I've changed the title. I've changed the title to somehow structure the lecture into five rules to move despite pain. Or, as you will see at the end of this lecture, five rules to move despite fatigue. And at the end of this lecture, I hope you paid attention because we, I will prepare you for a quiz. At the end of the lecture, we'll do a small quiz and you can win Belgium beer. 
those who win the quiz will get free Belgium beer. So pay attention. And I will start with a question for you guys. And it has a little bit to do with smoking. <clears throat> what if dry needling, massage, acupuncture, orthopedic surgery and smoking in common? Who has an idea? Feel free to speak out loud. For this question, there's no Belgian beer to win. This is just a warming up question. No idea? Any guess? Anyone guessing? No? Well, what they have in common is they all have short term analgesic effects. Established short term analgesic effects. Even smoking. There's a systematic review out there showing that if you smoke one cigarette, you relieve pain. Even somebody who never smoked in their life, if they smoke their first cigarette, they have an analgesic effect, which is even similar to dry needling or massage therapy. But, of course, that's not what, the, what we want. We don't want them to start smoking, and we don't want only short-term analgesic effects. We want long-term effects. And this accounts for fatigue as well. We want long-term benefits, we don't want short-term benefits. And that brings me to the first of the five rules to move despite pain or to move despite fatigue. We need to focus on long-term benefits rather than focusing on short-term benefits. And that's where it goes wrong a lot of time because also patients, they want to have the short-term benefits. So we need to convince them that the long-term benefits are the ones that count. This was a type of communication that I used to apply, for instance, in people having osteoarthritis. The patient on the treadmill, and I'm telling to them, please tell me immediately when you feel any change in your knee pain while running. Again, this is focusing on short-term effects. This is not a good idea. This is not how we should communicate to our patients. This is catastrophizing our patients. This is making things worse. This is making them hypervigilant to their own pain and their own sensory input. So we need to do the reverse. We need to make sure that we address their maladaptive beliefs and attitudes first prior to having them do exercise. Because those maladaptive beliefs like catastrophizing either pain or fatigue, catastrophizing uh, hypervigilance, fear of movement, they're all barriers to either initiating or continuing with the exercise program. So it's our job as a clinician to get the patient beyond the barrier. So the patient is the horse and it will be the horse itself who jumps over the barrier. But it's us, the jockey, the therapist who coaches the horse, the patient to jump over the barrier. And that's what we need to do if we want to target those long term benefits which are evidence-based for people with chronic pain and chronic fatigue. And there's a way to do that. The way to do that is educating them first. For people having chronic pain, there's pain neuroscience education. For people with fatigue, we can educate them about fatigue and the, the, the biopsychosocial nature of fatigue. And changing their beliefs about those symptoms is the way to change their behavior, their attitude towards their medical problem and therefore they are more likely to adhere in the long term to exercise and physical activity programs. But this pain education idea probably should be adapted to our current understanding of behavior of people and therefore we propose also to combine this with communication uh, techniques like for instance motivational interviewing 
which is probably much more effective in the long term to integrate it into a behavioral approach, including physical activity and exercise interventions. But regardless whether or not you combine uh, educational strategies with motivational interviewing, for sure it's an effective intervention to address those barriers, not so much to make people pain-free, not at all. In its, on its own, it's not that effective, but to combine it with exercise interventions, it's a very powerful way to approach people with chronic pain. And, of course, if you combine educational strategies with motivational interviewing, you can somehow upgrade the educational approach towards a communicational approach. But does it make a lot of difference where you educate them about the biopsychosocial nature about pain versus the biomedical features of pain? Well, in people with chronic spinal pain, as we did in this study, there's not much difference between the two types of educations, as you can see from this uh, graph. Because the blue group uh, is the experimental group receiving pain neuroscience education, and the red group is the group receiving biomedical education classical, biomechanical, or biomedical type of education. As you can see, both groups get a little bit better, but there's not much difference between the two groups. However, in the next phase, when we start to exercise them, then the two groups separate. And the blue group does much better in terms of pain vigilance and awareness, which is one of those barriers for people initiating or continuing the exercise program. Uh, but the same we see for catastroph catastrophic thinking, the same we see for pain disability. So the difference appears only when they start to exercise. And the nice thing is that the differences that we see, we see them that they continue to be there 12 months after finishing the treatment. So it's a long-term effect. Same graph, different outcome measure, pain disability, we see the same thing. The difference happens when they start to exercise, not during the educational phase. In general, what did we see uh, from pre to post treatment in the experimental group? We saw nice improvements in pain, but also all those barriers for doing exercise therapy improved spectacularly, including symptoms and uh, psychophysiological testings for central sensitization. The effect sizes were medium to large. We also assessed brain changes, but unfortunately we didn't see any structural brain differences in terms of gray matter or white matter changes. So the neuroscientists on board of this study were unhappy, but the patients were happy and we as clinical scientists were happy as well because the patients were doing very well. So this brings us to the second rule. We need to improve their beliefs first before we start to exercise them. And education is a powerful way of doing that. Do it before you start to exercise them. Another question for you guys. This is a, to me, a rather classical statement from a chronic pain patient or it can even be a chronic fatigue patient. But the question for you guys, is this avoidance behavior that he or she is expressing in this statement or is it persistent type of behavior? So take the time to read the statement and then make up your mind whether it's avoidance or persistence. Okay, let's vote. Raise your hand if you think this is avoidance behavior. A couple of them are raising their hands. Raise your hand if you think this is persistence behavior. A little bit more people going for persistence behavior. This is a classical example of persistence behavior. This is not avoidance behavior. 
if and this is also to make it clear to you guys that not all activities which are problematic to people with chronic pain or chronic fatigue are actually in the avoidance category some people and not nearly all people have at least some activities that they continue in despite of increasing their pain increasing their fatigue levels and they are classified as persistence behavior and they are not avoidance behavior of course many patients have some activities that they avoid and in case they do avoid those activities then of course we can apply graded activity graded exercise therapy or if the level of fear is really high then we need to apply graded exposure in vivo to overcome the high levels of fear so it's always very individually tailored and it's not a matter of simply building up the level of activity or exercise program no it really depends on activity to activity in each different patient and for those activities that they continue in despite of increasing fatigue and pain levels we should not grade those activities on the contrary we should provide them with acceptance based interventions pacing strategies pacing activity self management or stress management techniques to make those activities more tolerable to them rather than grading them or building them or making it even more worse to them so it's a really individually tailored approach in every single patient for instance a cancer survivor reporting certain physical activity limitations one of those activity limitations was playing tennis she stopped playing tennis even though she loved to play tennis but she stopped it because and she clearly showed avoidance behavior to us because she had a strong belief that playing tennis was much too high for her and it was not good for her health and her shoulder following the uh, the breast cancer surgery and on the other hand she always continued ironing even though she hated ironing so you see the cha the, the choices that patients make are often rather difficult to comprehend so for playing tennis and for bringing her back to playing tennis we need to apply graded activity or graded exposure depending on the level of fear towards playing tennis and for ironing we do not include any ironing exercises in there except for teaching the patient acceptance based interventions spacing strategies stress management strategies to make it more tolerable for her to do the ironing during daily life so this is the third rule only great avoided activities if not you might end up over stressing your patients talking about stress one of those positive stress effects of exercise therapy is that it mobilizes stored immune cells and this happens rather fast even during exercise and you can see that in the hours following exercise as well every single bout of exercise is always characterized by a small grade a low grade inflammatory response and the more you are uh, used to that type of exercise the smaller the inflammatory response following that exercise is and that's a normal response it's a normal stress response it's a healthy human response and to somehow combat and recover from that pro-inflammatory exercise response we have the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis because exercise also activ activates this, Im this important stress response system in the brain and this is particularly important during the recovery phase following exercise because cortisol that you see here on the lower part of the slide is one of those end products of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and cortisol is powerful to decrease the pro-inflammatory response following exercise so we need an, a proper functioning of this HPA axis 
to allow patients to recover from exercise and to recover from the immune response to exercise. However, many people with chronic fatigue and many people with chronic pain do not have a normal functioning of this HPA axis. This has been shown in people with chronic whiplash, this has been shown in people with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, people who survived cancer. And it's not happening in all those patients, but at least in an important subgroup. About 15% of those patients have a malfunctioning of this HPA axis. So they do not produce enough cortisol in response to physical and emotional stressors. Take a look at this slide, and this slide summarizes two, four, six important features of people having whiplash associated disorders. And my question to you guys is which of those six features is not clinically important? Which of those is an epiphenomenon? Anyone knows the answer to this question? If you don't know, you can always guess. Can you repeat it? <coughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good idea, but that is of clinical importance, apparently, because that's something which is related to symptoms and the disability that they experience during daily life. But this one, the lower one, which is the most easy one for us physiotherapists to comprehend, this one is not so important to them. If you treat this, if you target the treatment on this, patients will not get better. You will be able to train those cervical neuromuscular control problem, you will be able to fix this dysfunction, but you will not make them any better. And one of the reasons is because their stress response system are much more important to them and their, their stress response system are really dysfunctional and we need to target the treatment to those aspects which are dysfunctional in these patients. So again, this emphasizes the importance of the dysfunctional stress response system in at least this group of people with chronic pain. So this brings me to the fourth rule to move despite pain and to move despite fatigue. Improve stress tolerance. Because exercise, even though it's a positive, very healthy stressor, it's still a stressor and you need proper stress response systems to recover from exercise and to have a positive physiological effect of the exercise. And I don't have time to teach you how to provide stress management to your patients and of course everyone in this room has some skills to teach to their patients but I want to highlight a few things which can perhaps extend your ideas to improve st stress tolerance in your patients. For instance, get them out into the green because we know that greenness reduces stress. And this of course can be easily combined with making them less sedentary and increasing their levels of physical activity. Another thing I want to highlight in relation to stress tolerance is that people with persistent pain or people who survived cancer or people who have uh, idiopathic chronic fatigue they often lack social support and this is also something you can include in your program bring in the partner into the clinic to make sure that you stimulate social support for their problem because a lack of social support often relates also to perceived spouse criticism. A partner typically responds in the acute phase and subacute phase of pain and fatigue in a very positive way. But when it continues and it, when it becomes chronic and it lasts too long, partners can respond to pain and chronic fatigue with anger, frustration. And that is a massive reason why 
pain and disability is further accelerated in these patients. So it's very important to address this. And we can address this and we can include the partner in the treatment and we can make the partner also a, a positive coach assisting healthy coping. And if you do that, if you make sure that the patient has a partner which is much more supportive, then you see that they become very happy. Another question for you guys. What have patients receiving chemotherapy, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, obesity, migraine, fibromyalgia and chronic low back pain in common? What's the one thing they have in common? Just say it out loud what you think. Yeah, it's getting in the, the right direction. I want to be a little bit more specific. Increased activity in the glia cells in the central nervous system. There is a massive amount of literature on the glia cells in the nervous system in terms of animal research. But now we have more and more data showing that many of those animal findings are really applicable to human beings suffering from many chronic illnesses and they have increased activity in the glia cells in the brain. For those who are not so familiar with the glia cells, our brain is stored with neurons, but neurons are not the number one prevalent cell in the brain. Glia cells are much more prevalent in the brain. But all the attention of the neuroscientists went for too long time to neurons because Neurons are easy to monitor because they, they can be assessed using EEG, for instance. And you don't assess much glial activity using EEG. But now we've developed techniques to monitor glial activity in the brain. And we've learned that the glia cells are increasingly activated in a variety of chronic patients. And this results in a low-grade neuroinflammatory uh, system in the central nerve system. In this slide you see uh, in red activated microglia in the central nerve system and in green you see a neuron. So this also gives you an idea on how prevalent the microglia are and they far outnumber the neurons. And they closely communicate with the neurons as you can see on this slide. In purple you see in the middle of the slide, in purple, you see two neurons communicating with one another and the synapse, the synaptic communication is influenced by the glia on top and below of the neurons. And this is done by producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, neurotrophic factors, and they increase the sensitivity of the communication and the efficiency of the communication between the neurons. And this way they facilitate sample sensitization and other side effects of the low-grade neuroinflammatory uh, situation that is uh, happening in the brain of people having increased glial activity. And this is massively contributing to pain, fatigue and other symptoms. Those glia cells are also a key component in sleep genesis. Because normally when you have normal level of glial activation in your brain and your glia are not overly activated, then in the evening when you ought to go to bed, your glia send off signals to the ner nearby neurons telling them to decrease their level of excitement. And this is telling the neurons to go to sleep. Like you telling your children in the evening, now it's time to go to sleep. But then look at situation in people undergoing chemotherapy or people with multiple sclerosis or people with uh, chronic low back pain, migraine, fibromyalgia. They have increased activity of the glia cells. And then in the evening, they, those increased glial activity, the, those those cells who are increasingly activated, they are no longer able to tell the neurons to go to sleep. 
So this creates a sleep problem. A huge sleep problem that we also need to account for. Because of course sleep is crucial for recovering from exercise. And if we don't address the sleep problem, they will not be able to recover normally from the exercise program. So we also need to improve sleep in the early phase of the exercise program or even before the exercise program. But on the other hand, you might say, well, but you've put on the slides, well, exercise therapy is the way to improve sleep. Yeah, but the effect sizes are really small. So not large enough to say exercise therapy is really beneficial for sleep in people with chronic pain or cancer survivors or whatever type of people having chronic pain or fatigue. So we need to give them specific, specific sleep management as typically included in CBT programs or acceptance and commitment therapy programs for people suffering from chronic pain. And I don't have the time to include all or explain all the details about sleep management for people with chronic pain and chronic fatigue, but I just want to highlight a few things. For instance, it includes an important part about sleep hygiene, and then you address those synchronizers. And those four synchronizers on the upper part of the slide, they are very important to influence your day-night rhythm. And often by, influ by manipulating or by treating those synchronizers, you can do a lot of good for people to make them sleep much better. For instance, make sure that they get some fresh daylight before 11 or 12 o'clock in the morning. That is a powerful way to stimulate their day-night rhythm. Another crucial aspects of sleep management for people with chronic fatigue or chronic pain is making sure that you initiate some associative learning in the brain of your patients by reconnecting the sensory inputs of entering the bedroom and going to sleep. Because many of those patients, they do all kinds of things in the bedroom. They use their mobile phone, their laptop, they eat, they read books, they watch television. But there are only two things you can do in the bedroom. One thing is sleeping, and the other one is something that I'm not allowed to mention here on stage, because Antonio doesn't allow to mention uh, this. So if you have any questions about this second thing, just ask Antonio. <laughs> so this brings me to the final and fifth rule to move despite pain and to move despite fatigue improve sleep self-management probably best in the early phase of the exercise program to allow them to recover well from the exercise and this of course brings us to the moving despite pain quiz. But I first want to go back to the title of this lecture and if you apply these five rules I'm confident that exercise therapy for people with chronic pain or chronic fatigue become a convenient truth. Here we are, the moving despite pain quiz. Are you ready for the quiz? So what we will do is, we will put up question after question and you can vote by standing up if we direct the, what you think the correct answer. Okay? And of course you have to have all questions right to get free Belgian beer. Okay? Here we go, this is the first question. Does exercise influence the immune system? If you think the answer A is the right one, please stand up. If you think the correct answer is B, please stand up. Nobody for B. If you think it's C, please stand up. Very well. 
So we, we have a lot of candidates for the Belgian beer. Well done. The next question. To get your patients moving despite pain, you need to, again, four options. If you think the right option is A, please stand up. <laughs> if you think it's B, please stand up. We should do a trial on that one. I don't think it's evidence-based yet, but who knows. If you think it's C, please stand up. If you think it's D, please stand up. Excellent, excellent. So we have a lot of people who are in the quiz and who can win Belgium beer. So the last question will decide who will get the Belgium beer because nearly everyone has got both questions right up to now. So the last question is, who will buy you the Belgian beer? <laughs> is it Lamance here? Is it me or is it Antonio? <laughs> if you think it's Lamance, please stand up. If you think it's me, please stand up. If you think it's Antonio, please stand up. <laughs> I want to finish up, of course, I think we have some rooms for, for questions. Uh, feel free to ask any questions, but I want to finish up with a little bit of publicity. Not this summer, but next summer, we have the fourth edition of the Pain Science in Motion uh, International Congress. This is kind of a special congress because it's the only PhD congress focused on pain researchers. And it's like with four keynote speakers, but besides the four keynote speakers, the floor is dedicated to PhD candidates from all over the world. And it's in Maastricht, which is a small town in the southern part of the Netherlands, which is uh, very easy, ac easily accessible. Uh, so you're very welcome to submit abstracts if you're doing uh, research in the field of pain and you're a PhD candidate. Please come and see us in May 2021 in the Netherlands. Thank you for being such a nice audience.